If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I will have two more uh, what we call topical sermons, practical living sermons, and then we will get into the book of Matthew after I get back from my vacation. I will be here. There were some thinking I would be gone next Sunday, but no, I will be here Labor Day, okay? And uh, we are, le- are, are Sunday before Labor Day. Uh, we'll be leaving Monday the 2nd and suffering in Orange Beach, Alabama. <laughs> All right. Harmony in the home. Harmony in the home. You know, there's a lot of self-help books. There's a lot of opinions out there. There's a lot of people that think home should be a certain way. But folks, as Christians, we have to follow the Word of God. It doesn't matter what society's doing. It doesn't matter what, you know, whoever it is, is doing. What matters is what the Word of God says. And you have to understand, folks, we are living in a pagan society. Pagan, all right? They don't, they're not concerned about the home. All right, they, they're concerned about themselves and selling books and doing all kinds of things. And we have to understand, I am telling you, we need harmony in our homes. The outline, number one, if we're going to have harmony in our homes, we must create a spiritual environment. We must create a spiritual environment. Home needs to be a spiritual environment. Number two, we must uh, promote total submission, total submission, first to God, all right, then to one another. And number three, we must show agape love towards one another, not selfish love, not love that we see on TV. We're talking about biblical love, biblical love. I believe with all my heart that Satan is putting an all-out attack on our family units, You can look at the world in which we live and see how hate seems to be getting more intense in our lives. Home is supposed to be a place where there is peace, love, and unity, and they they should be found there. The devil knows that if he can keep the home a battleground, then bad attitudes will prevail in all areas of our lives. God's plans for families is to have a Christian man and a Christian woman to be married have children and raise them to be Christians, to have Christian values also. This isn't, sl- this isn't sliding being single. There is nothing wrong with being single. God has a purpose for all people in life. Everyone has to choose what they think God's will for their lives is. And one thing about people that can't, can't have children, adopting children is a wonderful option. Let's look at God's plan for the family. Ephesians 5, verse 15. And if you look at the top of that section, it says, walk in wisdom. Folks, we need wisdom as we lead our homes. And there are people even now sitting out there, you think, well, I'm a senior adult, and you know, we've been married for 55 years. You're still modeling biblical marriage. You still need to uh, help your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to know God's plan for the home. And folks, there's no such thing as a perfect home. All right, we go back to the leave it to beaver days, okay? Or Mayberry RFD, okay? Back when you could watch TV, all right? But folks, the Bible is clear here. It is clear here. Verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly uh, circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly means careful. Be careful what with your walk. Be careful with your conduct. Be careful with where you step. Folks, I am telling you as parents and grandparents, the little eyes are watching you. The little ears are listening to you, and we need to be wise, wise. Hold your finger there and go to Proverbs 9. Proverbs 9. Proverbs 9. I'm going to get there. 
Proverbs 9, verse 9, give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. Nobody's arrived spiritually. Nobody's arrived as the best parent. We're, we're not, we, most of us have not won the award parents of the year. So we have to be wise with what we do, and we need to keep learning. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Never be satisfied where you are spiritually in your life. Never be satisfied where you are as a family unit. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Folks, our society has forgotten what the fear of the Lord is. They take God's name in vain and just chuckle about it. It's, folks, it is the language of the ignorant. We need to understand we need God-fearing homes. We need God-fearing mothers and fathers. We need God-fearing aunts and uncles and, and grandparents. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Where do we get wisdom? Folks, we get it from God. Where do we get wisdom? And we can do this every day from the Bible. The Bible is chock full of wisdom. The Bible is chock full of how to raise a family and a godly family. And it says in verse 11, for by me your days will be multiplied and your years of life shall be added unto you. Wisdom, folks, we need to seek wisdom with all of our hearts. See then, back in our text, that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeem in the times because the days are evil. When you redeem times, it means you're using your time wisely. Folks, I am telling you, it is incredible how much time people use either watching TV or on the internet or on their phones. And folks, these, these things sometimes, and I'm not saying you sh shouldn't have these things. I'm simply saying you need to use your time wisely. And it's like when we, you know, when we have lunch sometimes with our kids, I look up and both of them are, are, are on their phones. Okay, and, and man, I love my kids. Matter of fact, Lori's rule is when you eat at our house, you put, it, you put the phones on the buffet as you walk right in the door. Why? Because it's, it's easy to not talk to one another. And folks, that's one of the problems we have in our homes. We are not communicating with one another. I've seen this. I've seen uh, you know people uh, sitting right beside each other and they're texting one another. And I ask them, "Why are you doing that?" We don't want nobody to know what we're talking about. And you know what I said? Maybe you shouldn't be. Maybe your words aren't what people need to hear. And they just looked at me. Folks, I'm telling you, there are times in our lives we need to shut off the phones. We need to shut off the internet. We need that, that entertainment. We need to get with God. Get with God and do what He tells us to do. Psalm 1. Go with me to Psalm 1. Now you're going to see I'm fired up today, okay? I'm just fired up. Because we do it wrong many times. And I'm including me. There are things that the way I raise my kids, there are things but, uh, that I should have done that I didn't do. But you know the key is, I can't change that, but I can make an influence on my grandchildren. 1-1, one, one, Psalm, blessed is the man, blessed, happy, content, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. I am telling you the most important book you have in your house is the Bible. It is the Word of God. But in some homes, it's not read daily. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And I believe with all my heart, if you are a couple and you don't have children, and how you do this, which way that you do this, is totally up to you. But I believe the couple needs to have their own private Bible study. Remember, day and night, and they need a Bible study together or reading together. I think the same thing is true with our children. 
Have your own ones in the morning time because everybody's getting with school, going to school. Everybody's trying to get things done. But at night, either around the dinner table, do you know the most worthless room we have in our house? It's the dining room. <laughs> we use it four times a year. Okay? And a lot of times when we eat, you know, we, we're in our chairs and we're all watching TV. Okay? Folks, the Bible says day and night. And there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to be wise about it, folks. If you are too busy to read the Word of God with each other and with your children, you're too busy. You need to change something. You are putting wisdom in their minds. You're getting them understanding about what God thinks. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf, leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Oh, folks, you want to prosper as a Christian? Get in God's Word. Our family units need to be in God's Word. And the husbands, the husbands need to lead that and lead out in that. And my heart goes out to single parents, whether male or female. You have to take on both roles to some capacity, and you can do it with God's help you can do it. So we need to create a spiritual environment. Now let's keep going. Verse 17, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of God is. The will of God. We talked about that. Folks, you'll find the will of God in the Word of God. That, that's what it's talking about. Verse 18, and this is a seriously misunderstood verse. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And he is comparing, Paul is comparing someone who is drunk with someone who walks in the Spirit. And you say, well, why did that happen? Well, you need to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 13. We're not going to go over there. But when they were filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, what did the people around them say? They acted like drunkards. Why? Hey, folks, early in my life, I were out dr drunk people act stupid. Okay, I'm sorry, but they just say things that they normally wouldn't say. They give advice that, that they normally wouldn't give. They do things that are dumb. And that's what he's saying. There's two choices here. You can either walk in the Spirit, and I got news for you. Think about alcohol. What is one of the things on, on, on the top of uh, the list as far as like signs? Thank you, Ted. Spirits. Well, I want to say what kind of spirit? Folks, I know, I know, you know, there are people that totally disagree with me, but I want to also point out that the church covenant, covenant our church covenant, says abstain from alcohol. And people tried to make this into, well, Jesus drank wine. Well, how do you know he drank? That's my question. Okay? And things were a lot different back then. Okay? A lot different. There weren't water systems and this thing where we filter and chlorine and all purification, all that stuff. Okay? I'm simply saying when we are influenced by Satan and evil spirits, we will make the wrong decision every time. One of the worst decisions a drunkard could make would get behind a, a, the wheel of a car and go driving. We have, we have personally seen what happened. My nephew, when he was 19 years old, did the very same thing, and I'm telling you, he was killed in a singular car accident. And folks, that is not wise. Not wise at all. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Hey, you need to have worship at your house. Christian music. Christian music. And there's all kinds of music out there. But folks, we need those good words. We need those melodies. This is what he's saying. In our hearts, giving thanks always for all things to God, uh, the Father, in the name of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And another thing, 
Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. You know what else we need in our homes? The fruits of the Spirit. Oh, folks, I am telling you, we can be ugliest at home, in our homes. We will say things to our spouses and our kids that we would not dare say in public. And folks, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a war zone in our homes. It should be a peaceful place, a loving place, a united place. But the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, here's what should be in our homes. Love, joy, peace, patience. Woo, you got, little, you got a three-year-old? Boy, they will test your what? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. All right? <laughs> when I was growing up, if I stopped my dad and I say, you know, the Bible says, uh, you know, you should be gentle. He said, I will right after you, I give you a whooping. All right? And again, I'm all for discipline, but I'm just telling you, there's spankings and there's whoopings. All right? He didn't take names. We didn't negotiate anything. So even in your discipline, do it the right way. Self-control against there, there is no uh, such law. So create spiritual environments. Number two, promote submission. Promote submission. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. What does it mean to to submit to one another, okay? And again, the first thing you need to do in your life is to submit to God. For the sake of times, uh, uh, Exodus 20, the first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before you. You need to put God first in your personal life, parents, and then in the, the home life, in everything that you need. Or that you do. God comes first. And I thank God for godly parents. All right, we went to church Sunday morning. We went to church uh, Sunday night, and we went to church Wednesday nights. And I understand it's a choice. I understand we live, uh, you know, in a different world, but I'm simply saying, I believe I am standing here because my parents, and there were times when I was a teenager that they forced me to go. I, w I was 14 years old, and I said, Dad, I don't want to go to church anymore. And he says, Son, do you want to live? <laughs> I thought, I think I, church is a good thing, all right? And I'm so glad my parents kept me in church. Oh, folks, I thank God for our preschool children's and youth ministry. I mean, I love our adults. I understand all that. But, folks, we've got to invest in these kids. They are the future of the church. So we must, according to this, submit to God first. You know, Matthew 22, 35 also, thou shalt love the Lord God with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your strength, and with all your heart. With all your heart is the first one. Your kids need to know that you love God. They need to know God is a priority in your life. And you need to promote that in your homes. And by the way, everybody comes under some authority. Even if you own your own business, if you decide, you know what, I don't think I'll send my taxes in. I had a guy in Lawton decide, well, I disagreed with it. And I said, well, how long have you not done this? He said, eight years. And you know what happened the next year? They come knocking on this door. We'll give you two options. You write a check for this or you're going to jail. Folks, everybody answers to someone. We answer to God. We answer to God. And submission is coming under the authority of, okay? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Look now in verse 22, I want to tie these together. Wives, submit to your own husband as unto the Lord. And here's the key. If the man is submitting to God and making the right decisions, if the woman is submitting to God and to each other, that means there's no, you know, very, very few fights going on. Every once you have a, a, a spat or two, one of the funniest ones, 
we ever did. And this was, I mean, we were young couples. And Lori and I got into a spat. Matter of fact, it was our first spat. And so we didn't know how each other's going to act. And I must say, I was the first, the one that said this. And I'm ashamed that I said it. I said, would you shut up? And you know what she said? Will you shut up? And I said, no, you shut up. And she said, no, you shut up. Three times we did that, and we looked at ourselves and just started laughing. Uh, folks, we were 22 years old. We were newlyweds. I don't even remember what it was about. But that is the wrong thing to say, okay? Submitting to one another, and wives submit. And here's the statement. Wives, I believe, would have no problem submitting if the man was walking in the Spirit and doing the right thing. I'm not trying to give wives a, a deal out because it says, and that submission, I believe, is, and Lori and I, we practice this, of all the decisions we've made in our lives, only three times in, we're coming up on 44 years of marriage, did I have to say, we disagreed, we could not come to an agreement, and, and just as Christ is the head of the church, I believe the man is the head of the family. But if, but if, I'm just telling you folks, if you're filled with the Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit, if the man's doing the right thing, you don't have to do something, uh, again, in marriage. I'm not trying to do marriage counseling here, but I'm simply saying if it's something wrong morally or ethically, you don't have to do that, wives. You, you follow God. You don't break the law. But I'm simply saying most of the time we can get this figured out. So the second point, promote total submission. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Also, Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. And again, when it talks about submission, uh, Philippians chapter 2, just go over a, a couple of chapters. Philippians 2 verse, let's see, Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and a slave. And again, you know, the way I see it in, in the ideal marriage, it is unity. One's not more superior to the other. You work things out. Our wives are not our slaves. And it says, and, be, and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, here it is, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Oh, folks, I am telling you, Jesus left heaven and his sole purpose was to die for you and I. He had that purpose. That was what he did. And he, he, he submitted to his father. God, after the fall in the garden, knew that there was a broken relationship there. Man has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I am telling you, God made a way. Jesus humbled himself. And I know for some reason, I think, and this is just my opinion, men have a problem of humbling themselves. You've been watching too much Happy Days. Fonzie, I was rural. I was rural. Men, I want you to practice this with me. Men, ready? I was wrong. Oh, I heard three of you. <laughs> We're going to practice this. Guys, I'm trying to help you here. Say it with me. I was wrong. Now, thank you. Ladies, did you hear that? Yes. Go ahead and applaud. And what I'm saying is, and really, here's the deal, folks. He's comparing it to Christ loving the church. How much did Christ love the church? He was willing to die for it. Die for it. And folks, we need to understand this is so important. So we need to create a spiritual environment. We need to promote total submission. Submission. 
And by the way, marriage is not a 50-50 deal. It's not a 50-50 deal. Okay, we don't mark lines down the middle. Okay, marriage is 100% of man and 100% of woman giving 100% of themselves to God. Folks, listen, if your marriage is going to survive in these times, you got to be all in. You got to be all in. And folks, again, you know, I'm not getting on divorced people. I'm simply saying, I am telling you, it's tough. It's hard on the kids. It's hard. Work it out. Find a counselor. Go to the Word of God and and submit to one another. Number three, show agape love towards one another. Now, I want to point this out. Ladies, you will like this. Paul has three verses to women. Three verses there. He has six to men. (laughs) Why do you think that is, men? Because we're stubborn. Okay? Hey, I'm part of you. I'm not, hey, I'm not throwing you under the bus today. I'm trying to help you. Okay? You know what dumb is? Dumb is doing the same thing over and over and over again and getting the same results. Somewhere, people have to change. People have to change. Husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. How much love was it? Christ died for the church. It's called agape love. Marriage is not going to last on friendship. Marriage is not going to last on selfishness. We have to be all in. We have to love. One of the first things I ask couples that are coming in and want to get married, one of the first things I ask is, would you die for her? And I did. God is my witness. When I was in Alma, I asked him, he said, I sure would. I asked her, and she says, let me think about it. (laughs) And folks, she was dead serious. I could see her face. And so I stopped and says, we got a problem. And I'm telling you the truth, folks. They left my office that day because I would not go on with the counseling when one of them says, let me think about it. That's how serious marriage is. You're talking, folks, until death do us part. Okay? And here's, here it is. Verse 26, they may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he may present to her himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Oh, folks, I do believe with all my heart, women will follow the men the Word, washing of the Word. I again believe this is talking about the Word of God. A a family that prays together stays together. A family that reads the Word of God together. I'm telling you, I will show you a strong family. Verse 8, 28, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, and he who loves his wife loves himself. He just keeps coming down through here. Men, he's just saying, they need to be first in our life. Some, pe- some men are married to their jobs. Had a guy in back ministries, and we had this conversation. I was in a scramble, and he was in my cart. And I, this guy, down the middle, on the green, putt. I, I'm so glad I was like, we won that scramble because of this guy. And I just asked him, how much golf do you play? He said, one round short of divorce. <laughs> I, and I was taken aback about that. Folks, your wife needs to be the number one thing in your life. Okay? I understand. Even in my job, folks, I am very busy. But I'm telling you, when September 2nd happens, we are going to drive halfway to Vicksburg. We're going to stay. We're going to go down there. And when we get near the ocean, I am going to throw my phone in the ocean. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're going to get an iPhone. Hey, I'll think about it. Okay? Why? Because let me tell you what my wife does. She spends her whole life 
waiting for me to get home. Her whole life. 44 years. We met each other when we were 12 years old. Okay? This is important. This is important, men. Pamper your wives. Love your wives. Put them first. Not a hobby. Not a business. Put them first in your life. And I promise you, things will change. Folks, you haven't been on this side of counseling. I can tell you within five minutes of a couple coming in whether they're going to make it or not. I can tell you that God has given me discernment. And I'm telling you, folks, only God can save a marriage. Only God. For no one ever hated his own flesh, verse 29, but nurses and cherished it just as the Lord does his church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And this was quoted in uh, Genesis. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. That's God's plan for the home. The last thing, children. Listen to me, children. I know we have older children and youth in here. Look at chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I told my dad, hey, I need to go to this place. Everybody's going to be there. He said, you ain't everybody. <laughs> I said, I want to go to this place. I'm pretty sure I want, I want to go to the lake. Ah, you're not old enough. You, you're not everybody. And then I got that. Now, this is what Grandma said. If everybody's jumping off a cliff, are you going to be jumping off a cliff? <laughs> Listen to me, kids. I know right now, especially if you're in your teenage years, most teenagers think their kids are the dumbest people on earth. We, we know more than you think we know. And listen to me. Don't embarrass your parents. I embarrassed my parents when I was 14 years old. And that day, I said, I will never do it again. Don't make stupid mistakes, teenagers. Mistakes that you're going to have to live with the rest of your life. This is serious stuff. Honor your father and your mother. Respect. Talk nice to them. Thank them that you got a roof over your head, three meals a day in a warm place, or now a cool place to sleep. Which is the first commandment with a problem promise that you may uh, dwell with you and you may live long on the earth. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, just go back one page. Verse 1, Ephesians 4, verse 1, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you are called with all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. Don't you dare tell your parents you hate them. Folks, they brought you into this world. They're paying for you. They'll pay for your education. Don't talk to them like you do other people. You ought to thank God you live in America and that you have freedoms that we have. And you ought to thank God for everything that you have. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I just hate it. God, some homes are war zones. They're just war zones. Everybody's mad. Everybody wants their self-interest. Everybody is accusing one another. And God, I just pray, Lord, even today that you would just convict our hearts God, I pray that we would do what the Bible says. God, I pray that husband and wife would 
love each other unconditionally. I pray that they would have that agape love, willing to die for one another. God, I pray there would be harmony in our homes. And God, I pray for our children. God, I pray that they would understand that their parents love them and they're doing what's best for them. They're helping them. They don't want them to make bad decisions that they made when they were teenagers. So God, I pray that they would start putting a family altar back in place. God, I pray that they would pray over every meal that they share. God, I pray that they would pray for each other sincerely. God, we need harmony in our homes. So God, I pray today, Lord, that if even a family, families want to come, even if a dad would lead and just say, hey, let's, let's go down front. Let's pray as a family. Let's start it today. God, I pray it would be so. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, I know really haven't even touched on salvation, but God, this is so important. If someone here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they would come forward and talk to us about salvation. God, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for your word. Your word is right. It is yes and it is amen. So God, thank you for this day. God, this is your church. This is your time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?